okay. Good evening to uh, everybody. Uh, it's indeed uh, a great pleasure to have this program this evening on a very relevant topic. Uh, the topic is democracy and society in southern India, successes and in, in emerging challenges, particularly in the times that we live in. It's indeed a great honor and distinct pleasure to have uh, Professor Rajmohan Gandhi with us today, who is our uh, chief guest and who will take on the subject and initiate his uh, views, give his views and, and a short talk before we initiate an interactive process. Uh, uh, Dr. Rajmohan Gandhi needs no introduction given the illustrious uh, you know, lineage that he comes from. Uh, he is the grandson of Mahatma Gandhi and also the grandson of uh, Rajaji. Uh, he is an exceptional researcher uh, in his own right, author of more than 14 books, and uh, currently is the professor at the uh, University of Illinois, and that's where he's talking to us from. Uh, some of his books are outstanding, and uh, 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 as a biographer, three of his uh, biographies are uh, you know very highly rated. Uh, one on uh, uh, Gandhi uh, and the other one on Rajaji and of course on Patel. The book on Rajaji won in the Sahitya Academy Award. But uh, more importantly, his re two recent books are uh, fairly interesting, although I haven't read it fully, but I've read a fair amount of experts and those topics are also quite close to my heart. One is of course the book, uh, Two Revolts, where he compares India's 1857, what we call as the first war of independence. and happening in India in 1857, and similar event across the globe on the opposite side in the US, the US Civil War. And, uh, and the reviews on that book has been outstanding. His latest book, of course, is very relevant to our topic, which is the history of modern history of South India. And uh, 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 he starts off from the fall of Vijayanagar Empire right down to you know the recent times. Given the, uh, you know, uh, process of democratic democracy and development, social engineering and other development that took place, I think Peninsula has led the way in Indian nation, India's national development, particularly in the context of, you know, in, uh, fighting against casteism, um, creating social engineering through leaders like Periyar and, uh, you know, the Justice Party and of course, Ravida Karaham, subsequently the DMK uh, ideologies have given a fair amount of, you know, uh, distinct, you know, uh, identity to this region, particularly the two states, Tamil Nadu and uh, Kerala, where the elections are going to happen in Tamil Nadu. Uh, the uh, state of, I would say, uh, social parameters, these two states lead the rest of the country. And given the pattern of electoral politics that has animated India in the last decade and a half, where it's uh, polarization and communal politics, you know, animate the scene. And with Tamil Nadu going into elections, there, this is a uh, time probably is of great concern for everyone who looks at, you know, democracy as something that should reflect tolerance, equity and equality. And therefore, I think the topic of today is of an extreme importance. Uh, the uh, uh, conversation will be moderated with uh, Professor Ganesh Devi. You all know him. He's an uh, a, you know, Orishas, uh, you know, a, exceptional uh, uh, academic, uh, prolific writer. He's a linguist, anthropologist, and of course, his first book itself won the Sahitya Academy Award. And he's the coordinator of the South Forum. So let me welcome Professor Rajmohan Gandhi on behalf of the Peninsula Foundation and the South Forum. And I, as I explained, the Peninsula Foundation is a young think tank based in Chennai, and we are distinctly, you know, happy to have you on board this evening. Welcome, sir. Uh, Professor Devi, you can take on from now and uh, conduct the proceedings. Rajmohanji, namaste. Uh, it's so nice of you to accept to be with us. We wanted you uh, to. Uh, to join us on the 30th uh, because it's a very special day for the entire world. Uh, but uh, since you are engaged elsewhere, uh, that was not possible. However, thanks for accepting this invitation. Uh, it was your idea that there should be a South Forum. 
and indeed i am very glad that a south forum of distinguished active thoughtful and uh, uh, and compassionate uh, citizens has uh, come up so uh, let me extend a very warm welcome to you to the south forum uh, you published the first history of the south some years back and uh, everybody is keen to listen to your views on the south and its role uh, however before we get there i have two very short questions for you uh, one is uh, about the essays uh, uh, you wrote uh, recently uh, and which uh, i could fortunately read the one that uh, the one that remains in my mind i just cannot forget was about the arrest of the distinguished uh, activist uh, working for khudai khidmatkar that piece you wrote the appeal you wrote was very moving and khudai khidmatkar is founded on the principle of love uh, now would you please uh, would you please explain would you please tell us uh why you felt so deeply moved uh and uh, what your reaction was i will then ask another short question and then we'll move to the history of the south and the role of the south today rajmohan ji uh, thank you dr ganesh tv and thank you uh south forum thank you the peninsula foundation i am honored to be at this conversation and Nimashul Matiswaran, I appreciate the welcome you have given uh, uh, to me and for this conversation between Dr. Ganesh TV and myself. And I'm very happy to be with all the others who are joining uh, this evening. Uh, yes, uh, Faisal Khan, uh, the person who was uh, arrested, uh, uh, kept for a long time in detention. I, I wrote about him, and basically, eventually, he was released on bail. Although many other people similarly arrested are still languishing in prison, a great many people we all know who have been arrested, who have not been brought to trial. Even the charges on which they have been arrested are seldom made public, and the number of such people is just very, very, very large today in India. As we all know, it's it's a very sad state. Uh, and each each of these uh, unjustified arrests and detentions and, and, det and detentions and arrests contrary to provisions of law contrary to our constitution each of these arrests produces very deep anguish in, in all of us who cherish the image of a democratic india where human rights are protected everybody's rights are protected that is the theory now faisal khan i was particularly stirred by his arrest because a i i i know him i, I know his work uh, b uh, the circumstances of his arrest were absolutely astounding he had gone to a temple in mathura up not too far from delhi uh, in order to build goodwill between uh, he has himself to be a muslim faisal khan he also belongs to up uh, he did this uh, to build a further goodwill and he was very well received at this temple and then when he uh, it was time for the afternoon uh, prayer according to his uh, tradition and he said to the uh, temple priest that he needed to now do his uh, a prayer and so he wanted to leave so the priest said well why why don't you do it here it's a wonderful idea to pray here so fazal khan at the suggestion of the priest then went to the courtyard of this temple he was talking with the priest uh, near the sanctum sanctorum but he moved away to the courtyard and there he and i think one other friend who had come with him for three minutes or so did their namaz uh, and then 
they left. Uh, now, it seems that one or two who were associates of his, who had taken the video of, of this event, of the conversation between Faisal Khan and the priest and the prayer, circulated these videos. And these videos were widely seen and widely appreciated, but some people looked at the videos from a different angle. And they spread the story that here is a Muslim man who is determined to desecrate a temple. And he has polluted the temple by performing namaz. So this allegation then led to framing of some charges and to his arrest. And it was the most painful thing, A, because of this uh, the reason for his uh, arrest was actually a wonderful reason of national integration and of peace and friendship and reconciliation. But then the Khudai Khidmat Gar movement, which he has revived, Faisal Khan has revived in India, is the movement of Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan, whom I had the privilege of knowing when I was a 10-year-old boy in Delhi. He stayed in our home. My father, Gandhiji's youngest son, Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan, and his older brother, Dr. Khan Sahib, they were in Delhi for two or three days, a few days, I forget how many days, they stayed in our apartment. And I have met Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan quite a few times since then, because he died in 1998, uh, at the age of 98. And so uh, I just felt that to detain a man who is performing a noble deed in free India, it was just too much for me to stomach. So I, I did write about it. Uh, anyway, many others also uh, wrote on this. And in his case, after some time, he was indeed uh, allowed to go on bail and he's free at the moment. I, I don't know whether the charges have been dropped. I hope they have been. I hope that the and apology and reparation and restitution has been made to him, although I doubt that, that would have happened. But anyway, I'm sorry I gave you a longish answer to your short question. No, uh, in our time, thank you. In our time, this is necessary. I don't think the charges were pressed. He was arrested. He was released. Uh, both were absurd. Uh, there's nothing to do with the legality of it. Uh, the the other question, I mean, this is this is the principle of social harmony and love in India. Now, I also remember another piece that you wrote, uh, which uh, which uh, I simply admired, was when the uh, when the uh, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement was hot in the United States. And uh, uh, the, the, you you brought the picture of that agony uh, to us in such evocative words. Uh, would you please uh, would you please like to say what what it was in the American psyche that made this principle of harmony and empathy erupt? Or alternately, what it was in the American psyche that actually nurtures so much hatred towards the black, even today. Uh, well, well, thank you for another important question and a critical question. And I, I would say also it relates very much to the South India Forum, the Peninsula Foundation, and the points that their Marshall at least what I made at the beginning about uh, uh, the role of, of South India and the values that South India has stood for, the values of equality and harmony, uh, that all of humanity is one. Now, this has been uh, one of South India's gifts uh, to India, uh, to the world. And um, and for it was a gift that was anyway. I, I, maybe I will touch on that a little bit later. But the um, 
in in uh, I want to say here at the outset that in my understanding, in my reading, the equivalent in India of the African Americans of the United States, uh, the equivalent in India are, you might say, three groups, three in one equivalent. There are the Dalits, there are the Adivasis, and there are the Muslims. These are three segments of Indian society, Adivasis, Dalits, Muslims. Three segments of Indian, of Indian society who are, who've been very harshly treated, who've been neglected, who've been often persecuted. Not that others have also not faced, faced hardship, suffering, neglect, indifference. Of course, people of all kinds have faced and continue to face. But I think if one is to make a generalization, one can make a, a valid generalization that these three groups have as groups, individuals belonging to these groups, women, old people, children belonging to these groups have suffered far more than other groups may have suffered. They, they are the equivalent of the African-Americans of the United States. Now, uh, in the United States, um, there has been ever since slavery was opposed and then slavery was fought and the civil war took place, so slavery ended, and, uh, the African-Americans got the right to vote, uh, and then uh, other uh, laws were passed to give equality, attempting to give equality, but of course we all know that laws are one thing and society is another thing. That's also part of the theme of our conversation today. It's the society as well as the thinking of of India, South India, that we are looking at, what we want to look at. So in the United States, uh, <coughs> great changes took place, and we all know that Barack Obama, African-American, became the president. But there was a tremendous backlash. And so in, in the last 10, 15 years or so, ever since Barack Obama became president, there's been a very strong movement in the United States, uh, which the thinking of which is something like this. All right, we got a black man elected as president. Well, that may have been gener generosity on our part, but we will not commit mistakes like that again. What we must never allow is the end of white domination. Whites must rule America. America belongs to the whites. America doesn't belong equally to everybody. America belongs to the whites and others, the non-whites, must live at the mercy of the whites. If they are good to the whites, the whites will be good to them. African Americans must live at the mercy of the whites. And we, we all know the equivalent of this in India, that some people may be given rights, may be treated reasonably well by the state, by the society, if they do as the dominant group desires for them. So this was the situation. Now, mind you, uh, the whites are about 60% of the American population. That still leaves 40%, which is a very large number. They are the Hispanics, as they're called, the Latinos, as they're called, with the, originally from Central America, South America. Uh, then there are the African Americans, who are about 13 to 14%. The, the Latinos are a larger percentage. There are about 4 to 5 or 6% of people of Asian origin, and there are other groups, people from the Middle East, people from Europe, people from everywhere. And many of the whites also, of course, strongly in favor of equality. So this thinking that I describe in a very general way applies to a very active group, very committed group, uh, but it doesn't apply uh, not by a long shot to, 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 to everybody among, among the whites. And many of the whites, of course, congratulated were congratulating themselves on what they felt was America's great progress, that America has done so well by the African-Americans. Uh, they're getting educated, 
they're getting good jobs, they're in influential positions. So Americans, white Americans are patting themselves on the back. And then when George Floyd, this man, he was in this in Minneapolis, Midwest of the United States. He was assailed by, by policemen. And then he was handcuffed. And then one policeman put his knee on his neck. And there were two or three other policemen who were watching this nearby. And George Floyd pleaded for mercy, pleaded for relief. And there was a brave young African-American woman in the vicinity who had a camera and she took a video of this. And many of you who are participating just now have watched this video because this video went viral all over the world. In eight or nine minutes, uh, it went on. And the whole world and all of America saw this young black man uh, begging for help, pleading for, I can't breathe, he said, I can't breathe. And then he stopped breathing. And everybody saw before their eyes, this young man dying uh, under the heel, under the knee of a policeman, a white policeman. That, of course, produced a tremendous reaction. And uh, there were these demonstrations all across America and all the cities of America. And whites joined and blacks joined the Black Lives Matter movement, which of course is older, but it, it got a tremendous a new passion as a result of this incident. George Floyd is a household name now. And, uh, people can easily say that George Floyd has changed American thinking. It is even possible to hold that, but for that video, who knows, Trump might have retained power in the United States. So, uh, so that, uh, that powerful uh, image uh, has changed an important part of America has changed the political reality of America, but there is still a very important part of America that remains untouched. And of course, as is, should be obvious to, to all participants, that what George Floyd experienced that day in America is what so many Indians, Dalits, Adivasis, Muslims, and others also, but we must remember that these are the targeted groups that so many people experience this and their names are not known. Their stories are not known. Uh, George Floyd's name is a household word uh, all across the planet, but the thousands and hundreds of thousands in India, the women, the girls were raped, very often underprivileged outcasted, uh, so-called, uh, you know, beyond the pale. So, so that, is, uh, that is a story that uh, troubles all of us. Uh, so one day, uh, what happened to George Floyd must not happen to anybody else in America. And similar things must not happen uh, in India, that is our dream, that is our prayer, that is our passion. Uh, but anyway, that is... Thank you. I mean, you wrote uh, so evocatively on this. Uh, I could not help mentioning this, but these two episodes in recent history, uh, Faisal Khan and George Floyd, uh, bring me to, uh, uh, you know, this question related to your work on the South. In your book, in the history that you wrote, uh, you have taken special care in depicting how people in the South have always maintained several identities. 
when sometimes the Tamilians speaking are in Kannada kingdom or the Telugu speakers are in Kannada kingdom or the Tulu speakers are in Telugu speaking Nizam kingdom. The, the, the mix and the, of course, uh, uh, with uh, respect to Kerala, uh, you have uh, quite uh, carefully, very carefully uh, deliberated on this. Now the question is, while the South has, as you said, even this evening, has imbibed, inherited the principle of harmony, social harmony, multiple identities, the, uh, as a, uh, from my language perspective, I can say the Dravidic people have inherited this prince idea of harmony. Uh, and in the present times, the Aryan nationalism is a threat to it. Uh, my question is, uh, would you please, for our audience this evening, uh, elaborate on the idea of the southern people, the south with multiple identities over the, I mean, you, you covered a period of almost a thousand years or longer, but last four or five centuries particularly, how these identities became part of the South, uh, the mind frame of the South and the mindset of the South. And if uh, indeed uh, that is under any stress or threat, if indeed the principle of federalism is being violated and will that uh, render the South into something else so to uh, vague a question, but my task was to ask you such a vague question that I do not interrupt you for the next 20, 25 minutes. So, uh, yes, I did make an attempt to study the South and with a focus on the last 400 years. Uh, and now, my defini definition of the South was not a very satisfactory definition. It was a, uh, you might say, an arbitrary definition. And uh, to my regret, I could not include uh, the uh, Maratha history in the history of the South. Uh, everyone knows that the Marathas and many in the South have had deep interconnections for a very long time. And uh, when people uh, used to refer and sometimes still refer to what is called the Deccan area, very often the idea is that, that the Deccan area includes the Marathi speakers, Telugu speakers, Kannada speakers. Uh, but because I could not cover so vast an area, uh, I was limited in my time and in my ability to do research. And so, uh, although I did cover the interactions between the Marathas and the rest of South India, the Maratha history as such is not part of my study. Similarly, uh, Urissa, or Uriya history is not part of my study, although again, the interactions between the Uriya people and the Telugu people are very much covered uh, to some extent. So, uh, it is uh, essentially the Kannada, Telugu, to some extent, the Goa is very much part of, of my area, uh, the Konkani speakers, uh, and Kerala, Malayalam, and Tamil, Telugu, Kannada. So that is the South India, and very much it is the peninsular part of India, which is uh, related to the Peninsula Foundation, which is hosting this conversation. In fact, I start my uh, story by imagining a, a, a traveler in the year 1600 who travels first by ship from Vishakapatnam, then got, comes south and then he turns uh, west and north and then comes up to the western coast and then alights in Goa and then he makes an inland journey. Uh, this is just an, a device to give the reader an idea of the kind of region and the kind of people I was attempting to portray in my story of South India 400 years. But you are absolutely right, Ganesh, when you mention uh, the, the unique contribution of Southern civilized, South Indian civilization 
to the notion of a common humanity. Uh, and I, I, I'll give two examples, which I've quoted in the book, but I will mention here that, uh, so I, I, I'll start with the one which is at the end of the book. And it is, uh, um, allow me, all the Tamilians would be very familiar with it. Yadam uh, Uru Yavram Kelir. This is uh, that whoever comes from any place in the world, uh, that the whole world are his relatives. Uh, they, that we are all kin to everybody in the world. And this, uh, this song was sung, we don't know when, centuries, centuries, centuries ago in, in South India. Uh, so this is the, the background to the culture of, 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 of South India. And um, so um, we're all related to one another. We are fellow humans. And, um, uh, and more recently, uh, in, in the 19th century, there was this amazing Telugu poet, um, um, uh, Gurujad Aparao, very famous poet and, and playwright. Uh, but he wrote this line, which was translated by another wonderful poet into English. And I'll give the English translation. He, Gurujad Aparao wrote, never does land mean clay and sand. The people, the people, they are the land. Never does land mean clay and sand. The people, the people, they are the land. Um, so a very interesting notion that what we must love, what we must honor, what we must protect, what we must cherish, what we must serve are the people. Not clay and sand, the people, the people, they are the land. And this also was the notion, of course, of many of the great figures all across South India. Sri Basava in the Kannada area, Sri Narayana Guru in Kerala, uh, and others across South India gave this notion. Of course, Tiruvalluvar, uh, Vemana, the poet, and if you include the uh, Marathi country, Tukaram, and so many others. And so, of course, Periyar was mentioned, uh, Jyotiba Phule, Dr. Ambedkar, so, uh, and many others. Uh, and I would say that uh, Rajaji and Radha Krishnan, Kamaraj, uh, who may not have belonged to the Dravida uh, Karagam stream, but they also. Uh, accepted this idea uh, that uh, we're all uh, human beings connected to each other. And, uh, and of course, you can think of people you know, across the South. I, I don't have to name all of them. Uh, so, uh, but if you think of Canada, uh, so if you think of some modern Canada writers, Kuvempu, very fresh, Arantamurti, so they have all subscribed to this notion of, uh, of all of us being, being together. So uh, now, um, yes, you mentioned that um, uh, there's been a lot of uh, movement across regional boundaries in, in South India. Uh, culturally and in other ways. But we should also recognize that reality has often been different from this ideal picture that people have envisioned and often portrayed. Uh, and we should, we should recognize that there has been both a great deal of interaction within the cultures of the South, but also sometimes a good deal of, of uh, misunderstanding and sometimes even conflict. We are, we're all aware of this. And in fact, um, uh, one of my uh, uh, aims in even writing this, uh, this study was to enable South Indians to know their history and to recognize that the potential was so great, the ideas were so strong, but often the reality was not so, so uh, positive. Now, 
uh, you know, when we look at the uh, 18th century, which is a very important century, uh, when eventually the British, uh, the French contested for supremacy in South India and in India, and eventually the British won. At that time, there was a very interesting French man, uh, military man, uh, Air Marshal Atishwaran would be familiar with his name, uh, Bussy, B-U-S-S-Y. I don't know how the French pronounce the name, but that's how it is spelled, B-U-S-S-Y. Uh, he was an important French officer in India. And he uh, wrote in 1783 of the possibility of the three Indian powers, the Marathas, Hyderabad and Mysore, uniting against the English. He wanted the Marathas, Hyderabad, Mysore. You know, these were the big uh, units, uh, powerful units in South India. There was also Travancore, which had a Maharaja, and there was the Arcot, which had a Nawab. Uh, so these, these three, Marathas, Hyderabad, Mysore, uh, Travancore, are caught. These, these are the five units, but they did not combine. They did not combine. And the Frenchman, who of course wasn't that, it wasn't that he, he loved Indian independence, but he was not for the British ruling. He wanted the Marathas, Hyderabad, Mysore to unite to prevent the British from ruling, but that did not happen. And the British did rule. And these five units in the South, Marathas, Hyderabad, Mysore, Travancore, are caught. He fought with each other. And uh, you know that uh, Tipu, end of the 18th century, uh, put up this tremendous fight against the British. We all know that. Uh, no ruler is, is ideal or perfect. Tipu had many, many uh, shortcomings. But it is a fact that Tipu and his father before him together gave uh, some kind of stable rule uh, to a very large chunk of South India. At one point in 1791, the Mysore that Tipu, Tipu rolled was a very large chunk of, of South India. But then uh, Hyderabad didn't support him. The Marathas didn't support him. Travancore didn't support him. And the British in the end uh, were able to, of course, defeat him. And, but until that time, uh, the British did regard Tipu as, as as big a threat to them, as big a challenge to them as Napoleon. So this is also part of part of our history. But I, I mention it uh, to to recall uh, how important unity is. That merely because wonderful ideas uh, exist in a climate in an atmosphere does not mean that people living in that area uh, subscribe to those ideas. And this unity was, was not demonstrated. Uh, so there is this possibility from the South. And uh, you mentioned uh, the federalism, uh, federal question, which is a very crucial one today in India. Uh, uh, today's India has many, many challenges to do with democracy, individual rights, human rights, uh, the right to speak, the right to to express oneself and the right to protest peacefully. Uh, and many of these rights are under great challenge. Uh, but one of the most serious uh, situations in India today is the erosion of states' rights, of the dignity status of the states. Now in the constitution, it's very clear, our states have tremendous influence and power. And after the uh, reorganization of states in 1956, the linguistic states that were created that brought governance directly to the people, that governance should be in the language of the people was a wonderful notion, democratic notion that was accepted. Uh, and uh, we have been talking, all of India has been absolutely concerned about the farmers' protests, farmers all across India, unhappy about the, the, the new laws. And although the laws have been suspended, put in abeyance, still the farmers are extremely keen that the laws should actually be taken back and uh, repealed. And there has been this enormous uh, opposition to it. And we all know that agriculture is a state subject. 
Yes, okay, in certain cases, the center also has a role, but agriculture is a state subject. And the states were completely not consulted when these laws were, were passed. The farmers were not consulted, states were not consulted, parliament and its committees were not consulted. Uh, and of course, the laws were rushed, you might say almost like an ordinance introduced in the midst of a pandemic without consultation. But here I want especially to underline the failure to consult the states, which is so important uh, to today's India. And so I would say that uh, the defense of states' rights, defense of the dignity of the states, of the culture of all the states and the culture of the South is a very important political uh, uh, question for democracy in India in the immediate future. And here I may mention one other conversation I had in the 1980s, long time ago. I was in England at the time, and uh, there was this movement in the former Soviet Union towards some kind of change. And eventually in the late 1980s, the Soviet Union disintegrated. But in the early 1980s, I was talking to a couple of scholars in, in England on this question. They were, you know, the great writers that emerged, Solzhenitsyn and others. So there was this campaign for individual rights, for religious rights. But these scholars that I talked with in England, uh, some of them had, were from Russia. And they said, no, the real change in Russia will come not because of the protests or for relig religious freedom or even for individual liberty. It is the various republics, the various stands. They are restive at Moscow's control. And it is the federal question and the question of the autonomy of the different regions of the Soviet Union that will lead eventually to a change there. And indeed, that is, that is what happened. And I, I do feel, and others have of course said this, that it is the defense of the federal structure and the defense of state's dignity and state's rights that will result uh, in, some, in, 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 in a successful fight for democratic rights in all other areas including individual freedom and religious freedom and so forth. So I will stop at this. I've already talked at very great length. Well, thank you so much. <clears throat> Rajmanji, the uh, constitution of course says that India is a union of states. And the union of states uh, uh, phrase has to be read as a verbal phrase and not a noun phrase. That is the states coming to, the coming together of the states is what makes India, India. And like you said about the South quoting uh, an ancient Tamilian poet, it's not the land, but the people. Uh, and uh, then you supported that by saying that it's a great democratic idea to have governance in people's languages. So many languages, many people coming together makes what, India is. Now, the constitution has guaranteed that, but the present government is not as much interested in the upkeep of the constitution or the constitutional norms or conduct or institutions that make India democracy. The present regime is interested, at least as far as I can see, or I tend to think, uh, interested in uh, turning India into a cultural unity. Uh, uh, that is a, the uh, historically not justified idea of some Aryan people in ancient times, bringing that idea close to the idea of purity and pollution, and then imposing that on all sections in the society. Now, the government has also set up a committee for rewriting the history and you know, of culture and society in India for the last 12,000 years. That is from the, uh, a, the, from the beginning of Holocene to the times, our times, beginning of Anthropocene. Uh, uh, Anthropocene. Uh, yeah. Do you think 
this contest contestation between india as a cultural framework a united cultural framework or india as a united constitutional framework uh, do you think uh, we will be able to see some kind of happy end of this contestation uh, as a historian what would be your prediction for the future history of india uh, and in that uh, do you do you suggest that the south i mean you came close to suggesting that that the south has a special role to play yes the south south i should add is patriotic and even more patriotic than many other parts of the country the flag of india is manufactured in karnataka 3.2 crore flags indian flags are actually made close to hubli and dharwad every year for distribution all over the country so i mean if if one wants symbolism here is that so uh I agree that the south has a very special role I would also say that all other parts of India also have important roles I I'm absolutely not suggesting that to the exclusion of other parts of India that the south has uh, uh, a, a unique role but south definitely with its history and its culture has a has a tremendous role uh, for protecting states rights states dignities regional cultures every local culture is so precious to india and of course a uniform culture will be the destruction of, of the spirit of india a uniformity will not lead to unity it will lead to disunity that but so so the local cultures are, are of tremendous importance but i i so i think one, one perhaps thing to understand is that the uh, the federal question uh, of states dignity states rights uh, individual rights Uh, are all democratic rights are all intimately connected and if you protect states rights we are indirectly contributing to individual rights if you protect individual rights we are also uh, protecting states rights so the battle has to be on many fronts the battle has to be all across india and i absolutely agree and I, this is uh, one of the points i'm trying to make that the south has a very very special role for which its history also has equipped it but i also want to make a point if you will allow me to make that uh, in addition to these general principles of what states rights individual rights uh, we must recognize one thing that is happening in india today i mentioned earlier about the african americans in the united states and i mentioned that the equivalent of this uh, are the adivasis the dalits and the muslims broadly speaking but there again there is a difference uh the hindu nationalists or the hindutva forces uh regard the adivasis and the dalits also in their view that they are also part of the hindu fold and so they advocate some kind of hindu consolidation and one group is left out and that is the muslims and so targeting muslims as a group and muslim individuals as individuals has in recent years become justified and acceptable this to me is a specific situation that we in india must recognize uh, some people have recently written also about it um, uh, but by and large this is not directly addressed in the united states uh, the notion of white supremacy and targeting the blacks is specifically discussed it it's not a battle that has been won in the united states by the way and although trump has been defeated uh and uh, biden has won and those who stood for an america for all for equality for all have won but the those who have been defeated in substantial sections of those uh, are mounting a tremendous campaign and now more openly than before white supremacy is becoming a, a an espoused doctrine in the united states but in the same way in india targeting uh, discrim- uh, muslims and discrimination against muslims and if muslims are attacked the accusers seem to get the uh, 
the, the the accuser or the attacker seem to get the protection of the state. The victims don't seem to get protection of the state. In many cases, I am speaking in general terms. Uh, so we must recognize that both as far as the state is concerned as as far as society is concerned, at the moment in India, the Muslims of India are a special community that is at the receiving end of, of uh, harshness, of indifference, of, of cruelty, of discrimination. And uh, just as in, in America, there is frank conversation taking place inside white families. Look, what is it that we are teaching our children? Are we really teaching them that the African Americans deserve full rights? That kind of conversation has to take place in Indian homes. What are we teaching our children? Are we teaching them that the Muslims deserve to be discriminated against? That they should be specially targeted? That that is absolutely against what India stands for. South India stands for, all of India stands for. But this is a battle it must be frankly fought by all of us in our homes, in our conversations with neighbors. Uh, it doesn't mean that we have to, uh, that we will easily win this. It's not, it's not, it's not an easy thing uh, because this, this propaganda, this instilling of this, this notion that just as in America, African-Americans should be targeted, in India, Muslims should be targeted. Uh, this, this has become a very deep thing in India. It will take an immense amount of effort, but uh, I, I, I feel that uh, if we are to really engage ourselves in this battle, we must understand the nature of the situation we are facing today. So much. Uh, I think uh, it would be good uh, if uh, we were to open this conversation uh, of, uh, with others present, the very eminent scholars, thinkers, activists. Uh, may request uh, Dr. Sambandan, Dr. Chakravarti, Dr. Vijay Kumar, to uh, Dr. Chenni, uh, to, if they would like to speak, ask a question, make a comment. Or Dr. Shanta Sinha is present here. Professor Devi, I'd like to make a comment. Or rather, Please. ask a question to Please. Professor Rajmohan. Uh, one of the, uh, you know, uh, you know, as you discussed, <clears throat> I believe, uh, you know, one of the most important threats is the uh, uh, forces that work, as you brought out, the Hindutva forces that work on, uh, you know, pushing their version of, you know, what they think is the Hindu, you know, faith and the Hindu format. Uh, is fundamentally, it retains the caste system, the hierarchy and the Varnashramam. And in fact, you will find quite a few judgments in various courts still allude to, you know, Manusmati. And I believe these three are an affront to human dignity. So when you talk about the tribes and the Adivasis, uh, while they say they're all part of the Hindu fold, they are second class citizens, effectively. And, and that will continue to animate the, uh, you know, uh, right now the attention is diverted, as you brought out about the issue of Muslims being targeted. But in the longer run, if you go back into history, in early times, it was this same practice that was actually worked against Hinduism. And it is one of the reasons why invaders were successful, because we were fragmented. And in the early part of the Christian era, the entire country was dominated by Buddhism and Jainism. To go into Tamil literature in the Sangam period, all the five great epics are written by Jains and Buddhists. And the Hindu revival, uh, Bhakti movement that you know, brought about Hindu revival later after 7th century AD, etc. In the southern region, the peninsula, they actually worked against the caste system and that's why the revival uh, happened to actually be successful sub subsequently. But the Hindutva fold actually brings back the very re the very processes that actually worked against the true Hinduism, and and that I think will that ever be recognized by the people in the way actually it's now dominating the political discourse in the country, and particularly in the peninsula. There are 
you know we've heard of stories in when in the rural regions and schools where children are made to wear different colored threads denoting you know whether they belong to the brahmins or the kshatriyas or the vaisyas or shudras and this is uh, this has actually come out in fair amount of you know investigative journalism in some of the rural area schools so there is uh, you know how does this actually animate people's mind you know in when they recognize that these are these are actually are uh, the problems that afflict the society and we need to get away with all the social engineering success in the south is that going to be negated by this push that's happening right now thank you for a very important question which is not so easy to answer but it's absolutely essential to to face what you're saying and you're absolutely right that uh, the idea of caste superiority the idea of caste distinctions the idea that there are some lower castes that uh, the so called higher caste should uh, stay aloof from and, that, and and that should emphasize their alleged superiority it is an absolutely horrible and ugly and uh, cruel notion and it should be absolutely firmly opposed but i would like to also to point out uh, you and i'm sure you are aware of this here marshal that these are two connected but separate issues the domination by the so called higher castes of the so called lower castes and of the so called untouchables that is a very major continuing issue it is not an issue that has been resolved it is a very important issue simultaneously there is the attempt at so called hindu consolidation and a persecution of the muslims and i think those of that those of us who want democracy who want justice who want equality must be aware of both battles we must be aware of the battle to for the rights of the so called lower caste so called the dalits the adivasis and fight for complete equality and opportunity at the same time we must be aware that the persecution of the muslims uh, is now in recent years has taken on a tremendous energy and it's a very major factor and it affects uh, india's life it affects india's relationship with the world as a whole so on both these fronts i'm very glad i am ashul that you you underlined the caste question but i also want you simultaneously to underline the the muslim question and the particular difficulty that muslims across all of india have to obtain justice that's guaranteed to them under the constitution and i i will say this also that in the south where this anti muslim feeling uh, was relatively low for a long time there also we all know that uh, the hindu nationalist forces have tried to create this and try to unite unite so called all hindus against themselves and and so uh, but then we all know that in in the south uh, yes there have occasionally been some issues but by and large uh, muslims and hindus have lived together uh, the mosques and the temples have been next to each other churches Uh, and also those who uh, who have not believed in uh, jains and buddhists uh, you know people in the north don't know how strong jainism and buddhism has been in in south india uh, this is also important to recognize but i think we, we must fight the, the the battle for caste equality and we must fight the battle to protect the rights of the targeted muslim community in india today openly the way in america people are fighting for the rights of the african americans professor ganesh devi can i come in yes uh, professor chenni yes yeah sorry i'm uh, making a very non political intervention but a wonderful thing happened today just before you came in and started the program uh, professor gandhi asked the air marshal about his name uh, mateshwaran and then he explained it by saying that probably this has something to do with uh, um, a cult of worship near mysuru and in kannada it is known as male mahadeshwara i feel uh, forgive me for be a little exaggerating it 
the solution to all our problems lies in this legacy because male mahadeshwara is a cult of worship of the subaltern castes and classes in karnataka which opposed not only the vedic uh, ritualistic traditions but also asserted the cultural rights of those who were excluded from kannada culture Uh, there are two uh, great uh, um, folk epics in kannada and one of them is called male madeshwara fortunately available in english translation and uh, the wonderful thing is you have uh, these cultural memories here of course belonging to the past and not to the present but very rich and complex cultural legacies where you have a continuous uh, Uh, resistance against the hegemony you know and this is what i think her karnataka has contributed and let us remember also one last point that though the egalitarian assertions were made by the 12th century vachanakaras uh, the people in karnataka especially the subaltern communities realized that very quickly this progressive movement also became very hegemonic and casteist and therefore the, the two folk epics including malemadeshwara kavya they started a protest and a rebellion through literature and through ritual and the great thing is even today it's a life tradition you see uh, people not only go there for worship but uh, the uh, the oral epic is uh, recited uh, overnight for two or three days and look at this today you have the air marshal uh, you know giving us an opportunity to talk about uh, uh, tolerance and uh, maybe the other things that we are now under threat of losing and look at the way in which these uh, um, you know the very strong cultural traditions of tolerance and then they are traveling from one part of south to the other isn't it and i feel that this is what makes the south so great uh, the way in which these negotiations these transactions and these peregrinations take place from uh, uh, one culture to the other not at the pan indian sanskritic uh, kind of a level but at the level of where people you know uh, people male is in canada forest and male madeshwara who is supposed to be riding a tiger uh, it belongs to the forest culture he doesn't belong to the palace culture he doesn't belong to uh, the so called uh, you know classical pan indian culture this i think is something that we should retrieve now sorry i mean i made a non political statement but later very, maybe i'll come in about karnataka politics if time provides a very very important uh, because that's how we will be able to counter this cultural hegemony of the aryan nationalists uh, that's this is what dr chakravarty has been arguing i wish you had mentioned montesami also which is about nomadic nomadic uh, cultures uh, from ancient times in the country thank you professor chen indeed So, so other questions please yeah yeah thank you very much uh, i thought i will begin with why i am interested in the south india forum uh, and then take it to what the context is today and how we imagine india you know it looks like we are talking about south india forum as a very parochial agenda it is certainly not we are taking advantage of the democratic traditions in southern india which Uh, Rajendra Chandni, uh, so he has talked about to bring together how India has been imagined by the constitution makers to revive the notion of democracy, justice, equality, which is slowly slipping away. So I think we are part of the South India Forum to reimagine and reinvigorate the way India was imagined by the nationalist movement, by the various. Uh, mass movements peasant movements many many movements that uh, uh, through the nationalist movement under the great leadership of gandhi ji nehru uh, all all the great stalwarts uh, you know so this is the reason why i am here so while doing this we certainly recognize the sufi 
uh, movement in the north. We certainly recognize the democratic uh, traditions all over the country. It could be Gujarat, Bengal, wherever. But this is a strategic point to start to push the agenda of a liberal uh, democratic uh, uh, India that stands for equality and justice. I'm saying this to reiterate that one is not pushing an agenda of North versus South at all. It is a South for India. And we think that there is a strong uh, regional movement, federal uh, politics uh, in the South, and we could leverage that for a strong India. The second thing which I just wanted to say uh, is that uh, while I, I certainly think that we should hit bang on the issue of communal politics, you know, and, and in fact, we should do that because it has been taken advantage of by the corporate sector and also certain sections of corporate sector. I wouldn't put all corporates in one basket and uh, is clearly smacks of fascism. And we will have to expose the fascist uh, authoritarian uh, 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 strands uh, that are coming up uh, in India's uh, democracy and how communism is a way of hegemonizing uh, the domination of uh, the corporates. I'm not saying corporates began with this agenda. Hindutva has been taken advantage of them to entrench themselves, which means, again, here I go to the issue of Dalit and Adivasi which means, again, an agenda of privatization. And what is it against? It is against looking at public good. It is looking at education, health, not as public good. It is looking at railways, not as public good. It is looking at each one of these uh, agendas, not as public good, and where it hurts the Adivasis the most. They're sitting over mines, and they're certainly a threat. So if you look at the Bhima Koreka, uh, incident, you 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 find that most of them who have been arrested without any basis are those who are working for Adivasis and who are seen as threat because they're sitting over mineral wealth. So Adivasis are a threat uh, to the corporates. Dalits are a threat to the corporates. So somewhere I think we're missing the link between corporates, fascism, Hindutva, and uh, we feel that the South India Forum will be a good way to launch an attack on all these and to unite with all the forces in India after having, of course, uh, building alliances in the South on the democratic foundations uh, of our country to build everywhere alliances on this issue of imagining India. The last thing is there is no India without diversity. There, there's no way, I mean, there can't be a cultural unity and then still save India. I mean, India is uniquely placed, I think, as you would agree, uh, all of us would agree, that there is India because of its imagining India as a diverse country. And uh, it's we've lost the country, we've lost the nation once we hand it over to the fascist. I just, uh, these are just comments, but I thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. I mean, there's so many sites of contestation, Adivasis and Dalits, uh, communal issue, imagining India, and of course, the role the corporates are playing, not behind the scenes, but right up front. So, JV, uh, just, a, just a small thing. I'm, I'm not a professor at all. I'm not even a, I'm not even a school teacher. Uh, Mr. Um, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Rajmohan Gandhi. I have three little questions to ask of you. Would you rather that I go one by one or put them all together? Uh, whichever is better for you. Why don't you put them all together? Okay. Well, uh, the first one is really this question about Hinduism within quotes, because um, whenever somebody comes, throws that word at me, I ask him or her, which Hindu are you talking about? Because yeah. as we understand it, it, it's a very broad spectrum from Vedic Brahminism to one from one end to the Charvaka uh, materialism and uh, Lokayuta on the other hand. So why is it, Professor, that uh, this, this sort of understanding of Hinduism is not being inculcated? Why do we not get it that Hinduism is not a homogenic block, but it is a very large construct? And closer to that point, what really is the year in which the term 
Hindu came into A, legal, and B, social acceptance? That is my first question. Would you rather that I wait for your response and then go to the second one, please? Okay, okay. So I, I can't give you precise answers to this when it came into... Okay, okay. But is, is the overall hypothesis correct that it is a constructed... Uh, yeah, but you're right that uh, so Hindu uh, has now been accepted as some kind of, uh, uh, you know, Hinduism very often is not a matter of belief, it's a matter of birth. So if, as long as somebody says he's, that he's not a Muslim, that he, if a person says he's a Muslim or is a Christian, then he's right. definitely a Muslim. So in some, some places, the default understanding is anybody who says he's not a Muslim, uh, he's not a Christian, is therefore a Hindu. So, so to be a Hindu doesn't mean that you have to believe in, in too many things. It is a matter often of birth. It's a matter of not being a Muslim, not being a Christian. Uh, but but it, there's much more to it. But the, in, in practical terms, in the census, for instance, in the census, uh, the census definition of Hinduism is... Exclusionary. So, so it's, it's a practical one. So they don't go into beliefs or, or, or which system of Hinduism do you follow? No, as long as people say they are a Hindu, they are accepted as Hindus. And, so, and the Hindus that the uh, Hindutva forces are trying to mobilize are across the board. So, so they just say that the Muslims have treated you very badly, so we must work together and, and stop them. So this is the... Uh, so they, but, but you're philosophically speaking and in terms of ideas, what you say is absolutely correct. That Hinduism is a thousand different things. So I, nobody can dispute that. I think 1783, the Code of the Gentus was published in London. And that got... Uh, that mingled with the British law being established in India. So 1783 would be the year of birth of this fantasy of Hindu. Thank you. Thank you, professors. Uh, uh, my second one would be... Can I, to, can I, yes, can I, yes, please. Yes, please. Yes, please. Uh, to start with, the Hindu was for the Sindhu River. So a geographical term, anybody on the other side of the Sindhu River was a Sindhu. Yeah. And from where the whole idea of Hindu comes in. So it's quite interesting that a geographical term which was used has been adopted as a religious kind of a thing at a later date. But then the whole thing was people coming from the other side in the north, northwest, looked at people on the other side of the Indus. And then that's how the term comes in. It's purely geographical kind of concept. Yes, yes, yes. yes. My, my concern really is that we being uh, 70 years into our republic, we've not, we somehow continue to um, not critically question these, these points. A, uh, B, going uh, to my second question, Professor, tying into the first one and tying up to the next one to come. Uh, if you take uh, Muslims as such, we tend, uh, thanks to uh, no, thanks to Hindutva and its Babri demolition, and even before Babri, uh, the late Rajiv Gandhi's soft Hindutva, uh, you've, they've kind of othered the Muslim and cast them into a homogenic block, which also does not appear to be the case because the South Indian Muslim is quite distinct from the North Indian Muslim. The Tamil Nadu Muslim is quite distinct from the non Tamil Nadu Muslim, by little knowledge. Uh, perhaps Professor Kalam would correct me later on if it's so, if it is not so. But the point I'm coming to is with, with the 60s, in Tamil Nadu especially, the Muslim identity was also fused into a larger Tamil identity, which held sway till uh, the late M.G. Ramachandran, till, till the aborted uh, move for anti-conversion bill by the late uh, Chief Minister Jairalita, till the Babri, perhaps. And to a large extent, it still holds. So, are we not again trying to? Uh, how do we? How do we, I, I ask of you, a historian, look to the future and say, how do we go out from this using these uh, precepts? You know. I think we have to. 
give a precise meaning of a word in its context. The context is very important to, to give a meaning. But I merely say that in today's situation, unless we explicitly, openly recognize yeah, I'm, I'm with you fully on that, yes, definitely. That both from the state and from society, that there is a, a deliberate, strong anti-Muslim, that we have to call this prejudice or this negative ill, this ill will for what it is, and we have to combat it. But what you say is right, that uh, in, in other contexts, who is a Muslim, what kind of Muslim, there are hundreds of question, answers to that, just as there are so many kinds of Hindus. So those are all debates in their respective places. Um, um, yeah, yeah, sorry. Um, no, no, my third point really is about um, the South, uh, the South Southern states as a, a pathway for a larger India. If we tie it to political reality, uh, back of the envelope, uh, the four Southern states, including Puducherry, would give about um, uh, 100 and, uh, 100, 130 in, uh, parliamentary seats in the Lok Sabha, whereas just the Bimaru would take us to 174. And it's not that all the 113 are going to go one way. There is going to be a healthy democracy, a healthy multiplicity here as well. So yeah. um, do you see the rise of regional parties as one possible block in which things can move. I ask of this particularly because in Indian political history, uh, both the Congress and the BJP have tended to be hegemonic in their political agenda. The Congress, for instance, till the 90s, till the SR Bombay, Bombay case to be more precise, the yeah. Union Congress were out to discharge anyone who was not them. So how do we marry these two realities, you know? about uh, the weak parliamentary lobbying power of the southern states and the hegemonic uh, tendencies of the centrist parties. For want of another word, I stand to be corrected. So, no, these are all very practical questions, but I think there again, I would say that a solution may have to come in each area in a, in a different way. Uh, we all know that, uh, uh, for instance, the, the BJP, uh, in, in recent years has uh, sort of encouraged one reg regional party against another regional party or one regional party against uh, the Congress party, say. Uh, uh, so, but in, in the end, uh, so they, and they would switch, they would move from A to B, B to A, B to C, and ultimately B, J and P remains. So, so this is the strategy that we must understand. So the response has to be uh, different in, in each state uh, but, and, 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 and between states also. For instance, I, I, you know, at the moment, we don't know what, at the moment, say in Kerala, uh, the, the left and the Congress are also fighting each other like, like anything, which is not necessarily uh, so wonderful for the future of India. Uh, but then uh, in Karnataka and say, in Andhra and Telangana, it's really been quite extraordinary how the how state level parties have fought each other so bitterly uh, that ultimately the advantage has gone to the BJP. So, so the South has also shown that merely having local loyalties or regional parties is, is not enough. Uh, you must have clarity on certain national and, and ideological issues very clearly and on democracy and on, on the, uh, individual rights. So, uh, so it's, a strategy. Yes, regionalism has has a very great role. Uh, states' rights, the dignity of states has a very great role. Opposition to over centralization has a very great role. Uh, but there, but there is no magic bullet that we have politically speaking. Uh, ultimately, the battle has to be fought in each state, in each place, and really to make the point again. In each family, in our conversations with our neighbors, it, we have to uh, speak very frankly to one another. Thank you very much, <laughs> Professor. And thank you, Professor. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Air Marshal, and thank you, Professor Davy. Thank you very much, Professor Vijay Kumar.
the chakravarti here can i come in hello please uh, yeah, yeah dr chakravarti please however before you begin in a purely lighter vein and if dr samandan does not mind rajmohan ji dr samandan works in the hindu center and so his query about the etymology of hindu as a legal term was very intriguing uh, dr chakravarti yeah well um my uh, point essentially is uh, that with the elections uh, imminent i mean in bengal tamil nadu and other places uh, when to follow uh, the point is not only to uh, understand the situation but also to change it uh, what is it that we can do uh, you see with this uh, first past uh, the post electoral system in which a minority of voters uh, elect a party which uh, uh, rules the nation and uh, the rest of us uh, keep watching without uh, really uh, doing anything about it this has to be dealt with by permutations and combinations which have to be built regionally which is not being done either in tamil nadu or in uh, bengal in bengal there is a, a fight being put up and by whoever the chief minister is but uh, the uh, congress and the uh, uh, you see uh, cpim and they are uh, busy uh, sabotaging uh, the party uh, in power rather than in uh, joining hands or building an alliance so there are concrete issues everywhere there is no awareness of the state strikes or about the great threat uh, that is imminent there is a complete blindness i mean to the uh, threat now the nature of the threat that is the second thing you see this uh, uh, i mean dr uh, devi uh, spoke about uh, cultural unity uh, being that aim i have an impression that uh, it is only a ploy it is all bunkum it is only the anti muslim stand which is uh, getting them the votes they are doing nothing at all for hinduism the battle should be taken to their camp and their plank because they had instead of uh, you see uh, protecting the forests uh, through which rama had uh, be, uh, had moved to the south they are destroying them for corporate interests as it was pointed out corporate fascist alliance instead of you know protecting and uh, conserving the temples where uh, the rama mm -hmm. is uh, they have been uh, building huge uh, temple in one place and uh, uh, instead of protecting uh, you see uh, the uh, tribal uh, uh, in the forest they are destroying the forest so you see basically this uh, anti muslim ploy is not a, a platform for promoting cultural unity or hinduism it is only for fanning hatred so that has to be understood and uh, propagated Uh, because they are doing absolutely nothing. Because uh, there has been a steady erosion in the funding for heritage, both tangible and intangible, and the, the, the funding has been never so low. And all institutions have been degraded and destroyed, which promote uh, India's heritage or Hindu so-called Hindu heritage. So that has to be understood and uh, propagated. That they are doing nothing for Hinduism. They are only fanning uh, paranoia and hatred. that is the second point the third thing is you know uh, in tamil nadu i mean i know the uh, you see the way the biocultural democracy has been promoted by uh, this uh, biospheric uh, division of the uh, you see area i mean in chennai and uh, also you know uh, denominational uh, i mean uh, democracy i mean the way the temples have been uh, connected with you know numerous villages and uh, they have nourished and nurtured you know the traditions through uh, centuries now that should also be uh, used i mean to see uh, why hinduism is not being uh, promoted uh, through these institutions by nourishing them and nurturing them instead of that uh, they are only fanning uh, hatred against the muslims so the erosion of states rights Uh, can stop only when the states are become aware of them, and the states are represented through all these parties, these congeries of uh, parties. So something should be done uh, to uh, explain that the violation of the environmental law 
uh, and the you know the liberal law uh, in the interest of one tax, one state, one religion, one election, one leader. I mean, has uh, been uh, accompanied by murders. Now the murders have begun with uh, demonetization. People have died in the queues. I mean, hundreds of them. It has uh, gone on with uh, the migrants. I mean, after uh, the COVID, hundreds of thousands of people have died on the road. It has uh, uh, gone on with uh, other uh, actual murders. I mean, uh, who have raised their voice and uh, murders which have not even uh, attracted attention. And then suicides. I mean, the, so uh, and the economy, the economy has been murdered too in a very, I mean, uh, systematic way only to promote a few corporate, uh, you see, giants. Uh, so, the, uh, so the thing is, you see, the, uh, uh, the fact that they are doing nothing at all for Hinduism, I mean, as it, it stands, you know, the, it's a, a, a multi-cultural uh, uh, language. It's, uh, you see, multicellular entity. Nothing is being done. It is only hatred that is being fanned. And the battle must be taken to that platform. Otherwise, how do you unite all these uh, parties which, which, which are completely blind and adopt, adopting a, an ostrich-like policy? I mean, in every region. So that's my point. Thank you. I'm done. Devi? Vijay, yes, you had a statement to make. Good evening, uh, yes. Professor Gandhi. Good evening. Uh, it's wonderful to see you once again. Indeed, um, very again. Uh, This is uh, connected to what Sambandan was saying. And uh, this is a question that I was trying to find an answer to. It's a very, I mean, I think it's a very simplistic question. But, you know, whenever we talk about Hinduism and uh, homogenizing Hinduism, uh, Manu and uh, Manu Dharma Shastra is evoked. Uh, invoked. Uh, what I wanted to know was, uh, was the Manudharma Shastra ever prescribed as the uh, law? Uh, was it ever given a kind of a legal sanctity? And uh, two, is Manudharma Shastra a descriptive or a prescriptive text? Uh, I am not an authority to answer your very important question. Somebody else should answer it. It, does, it gave do's and don'ts. And it was used uh, uh, as uh, so far as the knowledge domain was concerned. It was also used in making appointments in governments. Uh, from the second century, Till about the 13th century, uh, it was also used in uh, in uh, uh, forging uh, uh, marriage alliances uh, between uh, the ruling uh, families and so on. So it was it was pervasive. It was in It was in application. And it was therefore refuted by uh, a, a, a legal luminary like uh, Dr. Ambedkar. Uh, thank you. There is just read out one question from one of the young, you know, researchers who was there with us earlier. He's put it on the chat. I'll read it out for Professor Gandhi. Uh, he says uh, it is a pleasure listening to you. You were mentioning about the discrimination against Muslims, Dalits, etc. So my question is along the same lines. As Indians, we tend to have multiple identities. And naturally, politicians are incentivized to exploit these identities using exclusionary methods. Do you see a move away in the short term from the kind of identity politics, as they call it? If no, then could you please talk about the nuances of identity in India? Thank you. Um, I appreciate the question. I think it is a somewhat complicated question, and we are beyond time. Uh, but maybe uh, Mr. Kanadasan, whose question I also read in the chat column, maybe uh, if he sends an email to me, I will try to have a conversation with him. Uh, by email. So, uh, yeah. Thank you, Professor. Uh, 
Uh, Dr. Kalan, all yours. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. At the outset, I think I would like to thank Professor Gandhi for uh, taking his time off and spending more than one and a half hours with us and also the organizers, uh, 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 Dr. Matishwar and, and uh, Professor Ganesh Devi. Uh, for uh, uh, having the conversation going and uh, the others who have asked questions. I just have a couple of points to make and uh, people have been pointing out as to how the diversity in India is getting affected and people are not recognizing the diversity which has been there. And uh, I would like to say that, uh, in fact, I have written about it. It's nothing new that I would like to say is that let's start with the constitution itself instead of we the people, probably we will have to make it be the people's because we have so many ethnic groups, we have so many nationalities, and I don't think there is any problem if we have uh, to modify uh, for another kind of amendment and then talk about we the peoples of India and uh, rather than just sticking with we the people. Now, the second point I have is something uh, which is, uh, to my mind, quite important. And this is where I think uh, some of the people who have written history in India have neglected a lot or have taken a different kind of a stance. And uh, Professor Gandhi was talking repeatedly about how uh, the Muslims have been treated in India and what is happening to them. And of course, the question, I mean, the point that he was making was that the, the, the Dalits and the Adivasis are considered as a part of the Hindu fold. And therefore, uh, the way they are dealt with or how they're being appropriated is different. and. Uh, I think the most recent thing which is happening when it comes to Muslims is the so-called, in quotes, freedom of religion. I don't know where freedom comes in here uh, when uh, Uttar Pradesh and Madhya Pradesh go in for these kind of uh, legislations and brought in these ordinances where they're trying to punish people for choosing their spouses. Now, that's the one of the most recent ways in which they're dealing with Muslims in India. But the other major point that I would like to make is that uh, sometime back, at, I think the early 2000s, uh, when the century started, there was a big conference in Bombay University. And this was on uh, backward classes. And of course, uh, Muslims were part of the backward classes, which were dealt with at that time. And there were quite a few scholars. And one of the things which was quite disturbing there was that some of the historians from a central university in North India talked about advent of Islam in India starting around the 10th and 11th century. Now, that is something quite disturbing. And since we are talking about South now, and uh, the whole uh, uh, idea of spread of Islam was completely uh, negated when you look at what happened in South. The South Islam started, in fact, says 8th, 7th or 8th century. But then the earlier thing which was there was the pre-Islamic Arab contract, which had been there for about four, 500 years through trade and other things in South India. And that gradually got transformed into a Muslim kind of a thing uh, after the seventh century. Now, this is something which many historians, when they write, uh, particularly about Muslims or Islam in India, they take the North centric and the Urdu centric way of looking at Islam. And therefore, this complete the notion of what happened in South India, not notion, in fact, what actually happened in South India sometimes is completely negated or uh, neglected or obliterated when people talk about Islam in India. The whole thing starts with uh, what happened in the North. And that's, I think, one of the things. The nature and spread of Islam was completely different in the South. And uh, the so-called uh, forcible kind of a thing which happened in North, whether it happened or not, is a different question. Is completely different from what happened in the South. Therefore, I think when we are talking about uh, Professor Gandhi talked about how there has been less tension, but of course, Karnataka is standing out to one of the places where some of the things which are happening in UP and MP will be brought in there. Uh, the so-called, in quotes, love jihad, jihad, which is being uh, taken up by Karnataka now. The other states, for instance, I think have had quite peaceful kind of coexistence between Muslims and uh, their neighbors in India. And that also has to do with this. And this point, I think historians have to highlight with a special kind of a, a reference given to how the spread of Islam was pre-Arab, I mean, pre-Muslim pre Arab contact, which gradually came in. And then by the time Islam came to the north, there were colonies and uh, societies, which Islamic uh, centers, which were already there in the south and started going from the Coromandel coast to the southeast. 
Now, this part, I think, is something which we have to take up. And I won't take much time just to point out this fact that uh, this nature and spread of Islam in the South has to be highlighted in many kind of studies which come up. And the historians, for some reason or the other, have not looked at it the way it should be done. Thank you very much. And thanks again, Professor Gandhi, for spending time with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Gandhi. It's been uh, wonderful having you today with us. Thank you, Professor Devi, and thank you, South Forum as well. Thank you. Have a great.